Have you ever been through a rough experience in a video game that made you so frustrated that when you finally beat that boss, you felt a euphoric rush of satisfaction? Well, that moment of exhilaration is your brain releasing dopamine. To the brain, dopamine is the key to satisfaction. While you consciously may prefer a specific variety of satisfaction to get your dumps for dopamine, your brain isn't so selective about it. If you aren't careful, then everyday things can trigger this natural satisfaction chemical to flood your brain. Dopamine plays a huge part in the human body, playing a role in executive function, motor control, and motivation. Moreover, it affects us behaviorally, as mentioned before. This used to play a part in survival when humanity was reliant upon hunting and gathering to bring in food. Bagging that big bison meant you and your kin would eat. Finding a bush of berries could mean poison or sustenance, and that risk-reward complex plays an important role. The harder the task, the more dangerous or more complicated it is, the greater the satisfaction. Before we get started, be sure to like, comment, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell to never miss a Science Get video. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Echoes of Olympus Mons, and this is Science Get. It may sound strange to say this, but even knowing these details cognitively, your brain still can't protect itself from this procedure being hacked. All the brain knows is that you are waiting for something or actively engaged in a task, whether it's cooking dinner for yourself and your family or playing a game on your phone. Your brain is waiting for you to finish, to drop that dopamine on your brain and give you the satisfaction you desire. Through the gaming industry, we see a prevalent trend forming that psychologists are just beginning to understand. 20 years ago, many psychologists would have scoffed at the notion of gaming addiction. Ironically, there's been evidence that pointed toward how this worked since 1902. The problem is most people struggle to connect the behavioral studies of canines with the implications it makes towards human behavior. After all, you're sensing. You have reasoning and problem-solving skills. That doesn't really matter, though. Just like the scientist in the case of Pavlov's dog, Humans have learned to condition one another in a plethora of simple and nefarious ways. In the eponymous case of Pavlov's dog, the psychologist rang a bell and fed the dog. And over time, the dog began to expect the food and salivate even when there was no food waiting for it. Poor doggo, such trust. This is known as classical conditioning. There's no reason instinctively for the dog to associate the bell with food, but after so many times being fed at the ring of this bell, the dog's brain begins to anticipate reward from the bell. Casinos have used this trick for decades. Studies from independent researchers suggest that the tones played on a slot machine have an influence on the brain. The presence and pitch of the tones played in the study environment were able to influence the behavior of even low-risk participants. The precise kind of tone builds up an environment along with imagery, color, and lights to cause the brain to be somewhat overloaded, making it harder to weigh the risks versus the potential rewards. It also excites the gambler, creating anticipation for the reward. In casinos, this is done by making the tones higher in volume and pitch when a player wins, and making the losing tones lower in both values. This creates the illusion for the individual player that bolsters the sense that because people around them are winning, that naturally they will win too. With enough exposure and time, these games can play a role in creating an artificial cycle associating the machine with satisfaction. Now, there are other factors involved in hacking the brain. For one, a brain that gets their regular dopamine from socialization, exercise, and other healthy habits is less prone to falling prey to addictive tendencies. So what determines how good that dopamine drop feels? Well, you do, but so does the task you're engaging in. Building a shed in your backyard, for instance, you'll get a dump of dopamine throughout the task as it expands your stamina. Completing the task will grant you another rush, making you feel great about finishing that task. However, if you're not a great carpenter, then you'll most likely get frustrated and your shed will probably collapse. You might want to get a handyman to install that for you. Unfortunately, you won't be getting the same kind of satisfaction because you weren't actually engaged in the task. Another good example is a game. For this case, let's take a hypothetical mobile game. You start up the app and the anticipation begins. The hypothetical Tetris Go game is great. You can practically hear the theme. You break a line of bricks. 
or you get a full Tetris, or you slot in that four bar perfectly, etc. These give you a bump of satisfaction. But what's this? There's a new power up? You don't remember the four cube looking like a bundle of TNT. What's this do? And certain explosion effect. You just got rid of that jumbled mess of pieces you didn't mean to drop in the corner. It still didn't save you from losing though. But what's this? For only a few Tetris points, you can continue. You were really close to that high score after all. What's the harm in spending $1 to continue playing a dozen more times? That's better than the arcade. Except it's not. I've walked you through the scenario of a fictional game, but these strategies are all in use today, and they are all tailored to give you little drops of dopamine here and there. Tiny quantities of dopamine released periodically by those little tasks or wins are intentionally engineered to keep you engaged, because the game developers know that if your frustration mounts too much, you'll reach a point where the potential reward doesn't feel worth the hassle. In gaming, we know this as a rage quit. This is a complex balancing act, but every game is doing this. Some don't consider the brain or have any interest in making their game act on the brain like this. They're just trying to make a good game, and the satisfaction the players receive from it is worthwhile, at least to those people, be it a board game or some mobile game. The question is whether or not the game creates an unhealthy habit for the person playing it. If you feel more frustrated than satisfaction out of that game, maybe it's the game and not your skills. It may be a small inference. Ah, oh, crap. It may be a small inference, but it's a known fact that the gambling industry spent decades and billions researching and engineering games to play on the mind. Video games, especially mobile games, show many clear indications that the companies producing and developing them are using the same research. There is a mountain of circumstantial evidence that suggests they are reusing this research, and channels like Legal Eagle will tell you circumstantial evidence can be damning. Loot crates and lottery-style giveaways are growing in prevalence. The inconsistent reward programs are used to hook you on the possibility of satisfaction. Accumulated point systems are implemented to reinforce the psychological glitch that tells you, due to time and money invested, you should continue to play because that investment should return. Most likely, it won't. This is called the sunk cost fallacy, and a lot of us fall prey to this. And the question you have to ask yourself is, does that satisfaction come at a price every time you play your game? For me, I begin asking these questions often, perhaps too often, but you know that casinos only have the passing veneer of concern for gambling addiction. They spent billions of dollars researching, developing, and engineering an environment and games that primed the brain to fall prey to the risk-reward paradox. Everyone in the casino is either on their dopamine high or riding toward the next one or they're counting cards. Regardless, the house always wins. Considering this trend in mobile gaming and games as a service, it might begin to feel like every game is a casino, especially when the winners aren't the players. To companies looking to make a profit off of your gaming addiction, though, your satisfaction isn't the aim. Profit is. To large corporations, you are just assets, and if they build their game in certain ways, with the right kind of dings, the right amount of waiting before you give out that consolation prize, it's not a question of if they'll get your hard-earned money, or in some cases, empty your bank account, but when. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like and comment what you think should be done about gambling-esque microtransactions and games. I'm sure this will be a minefield, so be gentle. And be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring that bell to never miss a Science Get episode. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time.